because I think they think it's a plug and play model. I'm just going to add this on and it's just going to work, right? They don't adapt it to the workflow that is required. They adapt it to the workflow they currently have. They utilize the same tools that they have and they're not looking at the evolution that needs to happen to provide either the service or the gross profit or the workflow that they need in order to get the end result. That's where your problems start. Welcome back to another episode of Strategy in the Virtual Controller. And if you are watching us on YouTube, you'll see our fancy backgrounds for Strategy in the Virtual Controller there as well. We're really upping the professionalism of our podcast. We're uh, up to episode, I think, 65, 66, which is pretty exciting, where Penny and I get to talk all things accounting. And today we've got, we've got a special guest, um, Jen Haugo is joining us, and she's sharing some of her insights, some of her expertise around the whole accounting, bookkeeping workflow, what is CAS definition, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to jump straight into the conversation and actually, Jan, share with listeners a little bit about yourselves. For those that don't know you, we've got a few Australian listeners as well who might not have heard of you. I know certainly US and Canadian bookkeepers and accountants will know you well, but give us a little bit about your background and, and who you are, Jan. Well, thanks guys for having me. I am an accounting professional, degreed, but not uh, certified. Basically, I started way back when the dinosaurs started, Penny Knows, and I went virtual, you know, back in 2010. And from there, I've just had this journey of kind of do whatever I feel like, let's try it and see where we want to go. So I had my own clients, decided to take a little job with a company called the Institute of Certified Bookkeepers. So they're down there in Australia and up in the UK. Uh, so I really got to shout out for bookkeepers and that to me has been my passion is kind of working in the bookkeeping area. Currently, um, I am writing my own business, but I'm also, uh, assisting with, uh, a company that is growing and needs to scale. So I am working with them as their COO and their head of bookkeeping. I love tech. I am very involved in tech and I love new startups. So anything that I can do to kind of get my hands on any new tech, I'm all about it. I'm, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's what I've been doing, hanging out with Penny, chatting about all the good stuff out there. I was going to say, it actually a bit rude of me because I didn't actually say hello to Penny <laughs> starting off today's episode. So Penny, how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. For, for those listeners, I just got off a 14 hour flight from, <laughs> from Sydney to Los Angeles. Um, here for QuickBooks Connect, which I'm very excited about. So yeah, if I sound a bit dazed and confused, that's the reason why. Penny, give us what prompted the invitation to Jan, as, as Jan sort of mentioned, you guys connect a lot. What was it? What was the conversation that you'd been having with Jan that you thought, shit, we've got to get her on the podcast? We're in Slack together and a group and Jan and I do a lot of DMs back and forth. I'll bring up questions to her. One of the questions I had brought up is the other day, it was a couple weeks ago. And I said, so we should be recording this for the podcast. Um, I had in one day a large East Coast traditional CPA firm who is starting a cast division where there was a concern because the, the two people running the cast division were about to go up for their annual check-in, you know, let's see how you're doing. And their billable hours had gone down. Why? Because they were running cast. And the partners were having a problem wrapping their head around. On the same day, I was talking to a client who is also on the East Coast, but much farther south at the other end of the United States, who is a CPA who went into so-called consulting and advisory service, found that people didn't want to pay. They, they don't want to spend money for that. And she's decided to go back into doing just straight bookkeeping. And I said, well, how do you have them set up on paying you? She goes, well, a flat monthly rate. I said, if I remember correctly, you also do tax returns. She goes, well, yeah, during that time of the year, I, I am really busy with tax returns. I said, so how are you doing your consulting if you're overwhelmed with tax returns? She goes, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so both of these, one is a very traditional, large firm, wants to do cash, but 
doesn't understand that, hey, wait a minute, the people running the cast department, huh? their billable hours have lowered. And the other one who tried cast and said, well, I, nobody's willing to pay me because well, you're working part time. So those were the two questions. And it, I handed them to Jan <laughs> and I said, what would you say with both of those? And it turned into a long conversation, which I'm hoping that Jan kind of discusses a little bit about today. Then, Jen, right before we started this, Jan came up with an even more interesting topic, which I hope we can get to both. Absolutely. Well, Jan, I mean, you, you've, I know you've spoken at a lot of conferences, run a lot of workshops. I know you've um, consulted to a lot of firms. Firm number one, how often do you see that where the large firm, they want to do, they want to do CAS, they want to get into this, but then, then when they're looking at the billable hours and they don't quite stack up or add up in, in the way that they, they're meant to in a traditional accounting firm, how do you talk to accounting firm owners that want to do this, but aren't quite ready to ad adapt and evolve their business model? Well, I, I mean, I think we all see this, right? It's really interesting because I think they think it's a plug and play model. You know, I'm just going to add this on and it's just going to work, right? Because we kind of do something similar, but they don't adapt it to the workflow that is required. They adapt it to the workflow they currently have. They utilize the same tools that they have, and they're not looking at the evolution that needs to happen to provide either the service or the gross profit or, or the workflow that they need in order to get the end result. So for me, you know, basically it's coming in, looking at how they're doing things and really seeing if they've made it an add-on service. And if they have, they've just kind of plugged it in. You, that's where your problems start, right? You can't, you can't let them just say, oh, we're going to offer bookkeeping and they've never offered bookkeeping before. Yeah, it just well, doesn't. Or they have, or they have offered bookkeeping, but 10 years ago when it was desktop, when it was up to the fact, when it was done on a maybe a quarterly basis, but not, not, not today's sort of, I would say probably needs of, of customers and needs of clients where it is as close to real time as possible. If you're not set up for it to, to, if you're not structured for that. There's no way you can deliver on that promise. No, agreed. And in your, I mean, to your point, there's a great way to find a great deal of excellent bookkeepers out there, but their mindset is 15 years ago. And, and that I think to me is the other piece is finding the people just because someone can do a tax return doesn't mean that they can do the bookkeeping, right? And you can't just necessarily interchange the people. So they have to also know the staffing that they're looking for and find those people who are tuned to giving, like you said, that real-time service. I was going to say also, it's not only the, the staff, but it's also the clients as well, isn't it? Because if you've been providing it, what, a tax return once a year, probably some tax planning twice a year, it's actually going to be quite difficult conversations converting those clients to bookkeeping, CAS, regular recurring clients, isn't it? If, again, if you, if you don't, if you're not set up to, to deliver on it, well, that's one thing. But also, I don't think a lot of firms are best positioned to market these types of services to their clients either. Well, hasn't it always been, we'll, we'll figure it out along the way? <clears throat> you know, we'll kind of start it and then we'll just, we'll, it'll, we'll work it out, right? So well, I don't think a lot of people prep for it. And even like yeah. you said, the mindset isn't there. They have no idea what that really entails. So for me, it's really... It it's, takes a lot of thought into consideration about offering these services. It isn't just, oh, we're going to start this next week. But I think I see a lot of people offering it a lot sooner, sooner than what they're prepared to. They don't give enough time, I think, to understand what they want to do. And traditionally, I have found that accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, they'll pick anything that comes in the door. They're very giving people. Sure, I can help you. because. Probably they can, but if you're going to do CAS and if you don't have a def definition of what it is you want to do, and like Brock, like Damien just said, what about the client? You don't have an agreement with the client on what you're going to do. You're going to find that everything's going to go out of scale and out of, it's just going to go county wampus. But your clients are going to expect more than what you're capable of giving or more than what you're capable of handling at any given time. And then, so I'll get somebody who says they're doing CAS, 
but they are actually doing a little bit of cast, a little bit of traditional, a little bit of uh, advisory, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And they're working it all with the same team. And the team is going. And also the, the performance is being measured the old way as well. Like well, yeah, the that performance is measured by billable hours. Billable hours. Where, whereas if you're doing a lot of the, this setup and whatnot, you're not going to see that. But actually, that, that's a, a good segue, and we'll continue the, this whole conversation about Firm 1 and Firm 2, a, about um, setting this division up with intention. And, and, and Jan, before we did start recording today's episode, you, you, you sh shared an example of you were building the, your agenda for QuickBooks Connect and what you're going to be attending and all that type of stuff. But why don't you, you relate that story of, of the QuickBooks Connect agenda and ChatGPT? Because I think that really helps understand one of the challenges firms face around defining CAS. No, thanks. So just for fun, I went into ChatGPT. I use it literally every day. It's helping me doing something. So I'm pretty conditioned on, you know, what I need to look for and everything. But I thought for fun, let's try something. I took the entire QuickBooks Connect agenda throw it into ChatGPT and asked it to pop out all of the sessions that related to CAS. So it popped out about 20, 25 sessions with the names and everything. And then I asked it also give me all of the sessions that are related to AI, because I kind of feel like that's a hot topic. It might be hitting it kind of hard. So there's about 10 sessions. So I thought that was kind of interesting because when I started looking at the sessions, the the session's titles didn't quite lend me to understand it was CAS. So I asked ChatGPT, how do you define CAS? And this was the result. It said that <clears throat> CAS encompasses bookkeeping, accounting, payroll processing, financial advisory, tax prep and planning, technology and software consulting, virtual CFO services, compliance and risk management. And essentially, it said CAS is a way for accounting firms to offer a comprehensive outsourced solution to clients who do not either wish to maintain an in-house accounting department or who want to supplement their existing financial team. So honestly, when you look at that, that definition covers all of accounting. <laughs> that was a pretty long list, wasn't it? <laughs> it really was. It really was. And so when you see that and then you go back and you look at the sessions or you talk to a firm about what is CAS, it could be anything. It's a wide open book. Yeah, yeah exactly. It yeah. is. And, and, and I think that's the, a big challenge that firms have and, and particularly is there some of them are probably prepping to go to, to, to QuickBooks Connect or the, the digital CPA later in December or, or, or another conference. They get all this information about, about CAS and the growth opportunity and the amazing potential that 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 um, that exists with it which I, I absolutely agree that the, the potential is there but yeah if you're not very clearly defining what you're offering who you're offering it to you're going to go down this path of what i think to your point you stumble and bumble along the way and work it out along the way which unfortunately is probably going to screw up the team screw up the client relationships probably screw up the partners as well because they're, they're looking at the billable rates and they're not coming in as to where they expected to be. So how do you, how do you sit down with firms to say, righto, you see the opportunity that is in CAS? Step one, what, what, how do you help firms or, or what's your best advice to firms that, are, that want to do this and want to avoid those pitfalls and, and the, the obstacles along the way? Yeah, uh, you know, for me, it's really about what is their definition? What are they trying to solve for? I think a lot of people don't know. They just hear it and they want to offer it, right? So they have to, like you said before, be very intentional about what they want to offer and they have to be on the same page. You brought up a point about partners. So one partner may want to offer tax services and advisory and the other partner may want to do bookkeeping and payroll, right? They're not going to be on the same path. So you've really got to get buy-in. You've got to get understanding what they're going to be offering what, and what does that entail. So it's really, it's so hard to sit down with someone and say, tell me what this envisions to you. What does it look like? And get them to outline that. And that's the first step. And you never start with iteration one. There's usually like 10 changes mm -hmm. on that when they finally come through. And when you get a draft, even then, that's not going to be your final working outcome. 
But I, for me, it's super hard to sit down with these firms. And that's the first step. And then you have to evaluate their tech. You know, what tech are they using? You've got to start to bring in this concept of you're going to have to change tech stacks. You're going to have to probably create a workflow. And then you have to look at the people. So it's people processes, right? You've got to look at all of that. And then you've got to talk to them as a very overarching view about how all of this kind of rolls together. And I guarantee you, probably a good 30% of the people I talk to, they back out. They just say it's too overwhelming. It's too much. And I think that's when you see a lot of people jumping in and just trying to do it and figure it out along the way. I'm not sure if it's controversial, but ultimately, CAS, whatever your definition of it is, actually has to start with bookkeeping. It actually has to start with doing the bookkeeping for the client so that you can then build upon with additional services. But ultimately, every, every successful CAS division I've seen, they've all started with bookkeeping. And I, I, I wonder if that's a difficult concept for some partners to get their head around. I, I think that that's exactly the problem, to tell you the truth. One thing is, years ago, with it, uh, I was first invited up on a stage to talk about outsourcing. I was on the stage with some people who did tax outsourcing, relatively well-known names. I was the only one on the stage, dig this, but because this was back in 2004. The only female on the stage. Yeah. Everybody was wearing a three-piece suit. <laughs> and I was in a jean skirt, high heel. <laughs> and I had an Indian belt around my waist because I'd just gotten off the flight from Wyoming. And the one thing Greg Lafal had said is they were all talking about their outsourced tax returns and stuff that they were doing. And I just kind of sat there and go, what am I doing here? You know, I'm thinking to myself. And he goes, so Penny, you do something different. What do you do? And I just looked and I said, I have year-round revenue. Because I do bookkeeping. Because that's something that has to take place every day, every month. And you have to close it and it has to be clean because you can't advise on bad numbers. Yeah. And most of these tax accountants have been handed books at the end of the year that are crap and they have to clean them up before they do anything with them. And they can't imagine being able to control that every month. So when I talk to somebody who says they do cash, okay, so... You get your clients, even if it's on QuickBooks Online or Zero or Wave Apps or whatever. So you're closing the books every month. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> well, what's holding you up? Well, the client won't. Well, then when you sold the client this plan to do this at this flat rate, did you tell the client the only way you can conceivably do this is if you have absolute control? Well, the client's really not comfortable with that then you're not goddamn doing cast because you can't get the information you need to make a just and honest and actionable advice to your client because your client hasn't cooperated with you in the first place. So get over that and go back to billable hours because you're going to yeah. be losing money. Or well, tell the client, the I'm point. sorry, you don't fit my plan. My ideal of what I want to do, and like Jan said, you know, you go in there with an idea of how you want it to work. You work on that. You build an idea of what you want to do. You build a team to do it. You find the tech that's going to work. Now you got to find the client that fits the paradigm. But actually, and really, you're constantly right? selling. You are constantly selling you. You're constantly selling your idea. I talked to a business owner the other day and she called me. She goes, I don't know what to do with these employees. I can't take a day off because I can't leave them alone because I can't trust them to do the job. I said, all I have heard you do in the last year is yell about your employees. When have you ever sat down with them and told them what your vision, your goal is and asked them, do they want to come along with you? Because you're not. You go into these employees who've been on billable hours, who've been using old tech and you're telling them, we're going to do cast now. 
Well, I think also what you're doing is, is you're telling them we're going to do CAS for our current clients. And, I, and sort of going back to something that Jan said around the technology side of things, if you think about a, a typical tax accounting firm, they're, they're got a couple, they've got, a, and, and just the client types, they've got a couple of restaurants, they've probably got some professional services, they've got a couple of contractors, they've got a full spectrum of small businesses, medium-sized businesses that they serve. And their immediate thought is, you know what, we're going to provide CAS to our current clients. We're going to go to our current clients and, and provide these bookkeeping services to them. So they'll be the first ones that we go to. But if you actually think about to, to do bookkeeping effectively utilizing technology, there's actually got to be a, a standardization of tech, a standardization of applications. And so therefore, if I'm thinking about a typical accounting firm, and I've got a couple of restaurants, and I've got a, a plumber, and I've got a veterinarian, and I've got this, all these different industries that I'm servicing, I can't actually build a standardized tech stack because I've got all of these nuances and all of these differences. And so maybe that's also the disconnect is if you are building a CAS division and starting with bookkeeping, recognize that it's not going to be a good fit for each and every one of your clients. And you probably have to look at your client base and say, you know what, we've got 10 restaurants, two contractors, a couple of them, this and that. Let's actually build a CAS division for restaurants because that's where we can start to scale. I mean, what what are your sort of thoughts, Jan, when you, you look at accounting firms that are trying to offer bookkeeping services to a vast array of industry types? You know, you can't do it. I mean, it's tough. Uh, that's, that, yeah. that, that is the perfect way. You can't do it. That, yeah. That's a perfect way to say it. You can't do it. And, and I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. Today, we were having, you know, my partners are here from India so they can go to QuickBooks Connect. And we were having a meeting with uh, Megan, who works for me out of Houston. And she was saying, I think we need to change the teams up and build the teams based on the client's verticals. And I said, let me tell you a buck. We handle 287 apps. And I said, the clients might come to us and say they're in a vertical, but what they've done is they've got clients, older clients, they want to go in a vertical. They're going to look for that vertical because they find one type of business they want to manage, but they still have all these old legacy clients. And those legacy clients are in different types of payroll. They're in, sometimes in different GLs, although that's not as often, but they're in different types of AP applications. They're in different types of, they require different types of reporting. And so I said, there's no way we're going to be able to build our teams to match a vertical tech stack. However, I do see in smaller startup bookkeepers who have started at the cloud level that they tend to have a defined tech stack and they do push their clients into. So I think when you said it starts with bookkeeping, that's where I see this growth taking place in that there has to be respect for the bookkeeper and what he, she, it, whatever you want to, or the bot has to have some kind of uh, avenue to give voice to what it needs to have for input and its parameters that it can work within to match what you need to do your advisory services. So you have to start with the bookkeepers. And oftentimes everybody reverses that and they start at the top down. If you think about that top down or bottom up, where does all the work start? It starts at the transactional level. You know, you can't, you can't get your summaries or you can't get your numbers to go into the tax return. And, th and those are two different mindset people. When you look at a person who's doing a tax return or an advisor, they're looking at the 30,000 foot level, right? And you said it earlier, they've, they've got to get all of those transactions in and they've got, you know, so you can't take a person who does advisory and have them do bookkeeping and vice versa. You can't take a bookkeeper and ask them to go out and analyze or, you know, basically review a set of financials well. I mean, there are some, but... It's not typical. I don't have the same skill set. So you do have to kind of get those transactions in. And I agree the cloud piece of it makes it so much easier because basically you're just putting numbers in buckets, right? Get the numbers in the buckets and then move them along. When you 
add in all those additional third-party apps, that that's where your workflow changes. Because you can set up bank rules and auto and, and you can streamline it. And if your clients are simple cash basis, literally you can do the books for a month, you know, in 15, 20 minutes if you've yep. got it set up properly. It's so easy. If you have taken control. Yeah. And that you are controlling the flow of the data into the GL. Mm-hmm. If you know when it's going to happen, if you can turn it on and off, and it's not up to, I got to call the client. The client. I need that statement. I need that. Say, oh, oh, I just, I got an emergency call from a client, a CPA yesterday. It's like going, I have two clients and the work wasn't done and there's a deadline. And then my first question is, we have 50 clients we're working on. Could you tell me the names of the two? You know, I'm not doing the work. And I go in and I look at the transcripts of all the meetings we've had with her. And week after week after week, we were telling them, we're not getting the statements. The bank has been disconnected. Oh, my God. Now the subscription's disconnected. And she's like, how come nobody told me? And I go, okay, let me just point out the transcript of the notes that we took. And it's like, and the, the response from your office manager was, well, the client just wouldn't respond. Oh, I'm calling bullshit on that. It's just such a cop out, isn't it? No, you know what it was? It came down to us getting yelled at. So I called no, bullshit no, no, on no, it. No, right no, no, no. What I, mean, what I, I, I think absolutely in terms of you getting yelled at, that that's that's not the right thing. But oh, the, client, <laughs> that's okay. the, the client didn't hit. Yeah. You're used to it. Uh, the client didn't get us the information in a timely manner. The client didn't do this. The client didn't do that. And I, I'm sort of calling bullshit on that. And, and, and I think, and would love both of your opinions here is again, going back to definition, I don't, I, I doubt the firm ever clearly defined what was required from the client as in to deliver these services, we need this, 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 and this. And, and I doubt uh, that was ever clearly laid out in any sort of service level agreement, any sort of, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, honestly, I have fired clients for not having the right bank account. Like if you are not, if you're going to work with a U.S. bank or one of those, you know, small like banks that's, you know, from Timbuktu, honestly, if I can't get a statement, can't get the information connected, I'm struggling or I can't even get a book le- bookkeeper access, right? Just give me bookkeeper access. Some of those banks don't do it yet because they don't, their software is so old. They can't add a second, you know, view only access. So I'm with you. So if you switch to a bank, like I'm going to say relay or something like that, where I can get the connections and everything with all the statements in. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a problem, but I have fired clients for not having the bank accounts that I have to struggle with. And Jen, could I, I ask a question there is, what was the client response yeah. for not wanting to change? Like, as you said, you know, I'm sitting down opposite a, a current client, respected clients, and I'm saying, mm-hmm. uh, we want to be able to provide these services, but to do that, we need to move you off of the bank of Timbuktu over to Relay Pipe. What's the, the reason clients don't want to do that? Because I, I, I would have, I would have assumed clients would be like, you know what? I trust you. You're my trusted advisor. I will do what you ask of me like what's the the yeah the response is a that's my banking relationship i have a person that i can go to i can talk to they get things done i bank there for years let's see what else it's right down the street from me so there's just these responses were very much yeah i'm gonna stick i'm gonna stick here because this is where i banked for 20 years and my response was i understand that but it's not accessible for us the next piece is the next level is it's very difficult. Everything is connected to my debit account. My everything's connected to my bank account. Like I have to go through and unhook everything and reset it up. So there was a lot of work on his part to do that. But at the same time, it's a lot of work on our part to yeah. sit there and try to get those. So if we're not going to come to a meeting on the lines, you know, essentially what I was telling him was you're not my my preferred client. No, but I, and, and, and no harm, no foul. Look, if you don't want to no. do that work, then we, then, then we, we can't deliver on the promise on what's on the website and what I've sat here and sold you on. I can't deliver on that. So I understand the relationship. I understand the, the setup and all that type of stuff, but it's better that we don't go any further now than, than save ourselves a lot of heartache down the line mm-hmm. rather than trying to make it work. Yeah. Well, and that, that was initially, that was our conversation. 
you know, who do you bank with? Okay, I bank with these banks. Well, these are the ones that we have problems with. You know, we would prefer you to move to these. Okay, so I give a time period. You, you have 90 days. And he didn't, he didn't meet the 90 days. Hmm. One of the ways that I do it is I tell them, look at if you, you do need to keep that relationship with that bank. I yeah. get it. Local bank, got it. Totally. I lived in a lot of small towns. Totally understand being able to walk in. It. When my legal name is not Penny, being able to walk in the bank and have all the tellers know who I am when one of my family members writes me a check to pay for Christmas stuff at Penny. And I was like, I don't have a bank account named Penny. So, but that's cool. So I was like, okay, keep that relationship. All I'm asking you to do is open up an operating account. And that's what you're with the number of clients, isn't it? You, you yeah, open up and I just saw, we're going to we're going to move money, money in and out. And yeah. you know what I do? I'll tell you what. I have a demo. I have a dummy account, and I get them on a Zoom meeting, or I have them sit down in front of my lab. I go, this is how it works. Really? Yeah, yeah. And and what do I have to do? I said, all you got to do is make the major deposit in here. I'll take care of all the rest. Then I've got maybe a month of cleanup, but they've already on the SLA. You're new to me. I don't know you. You don't know me. We don't know what's under the sheets. I'm going to charge you a little up front. Then it'll go to a monthly fee once we know where we're at. Don't. That little, that little, we have a bronze, silver, and gold. You know what? Nobody can do that Nobody stuff. Nobody does. Like, you have to, it's a really, that, was a, that was a marketing yeah. ploy, just like cloud, just like cast. It's all yeah. marketing. But, and then you just, okay, and I'm going to work with you. And once I get all that procedure done, I get it all what I pass them off to somebody else on my team. So I am the client success manager, right? Yep. Technology problems come up, I get the call. Relationship problem comes up, I get the call. Transactional stuff. Don't ask me what's going on. My bookkeepers are taking care of that. That's why I couldn't. I didn't know what the client was talking about when she said these two clients. I'm going, which two? I don't know. I'm not in there all the time looking at that crap. I can't do that stuff. I don't want to do that stuff. That's all what I'm good at. So why do it? But I am really good at this. I'll get the client. I'll bring it in. I'll set them up. And then once it's all clean and stuff, I can turn around and advise them. Yeah. I mean, I think you're much I kinder be... than I was. Sorry, <laughs> Damien. <laughs> no, 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 but actually, I, I think what uh, an interesting point there that you nobody's ever said I've been kinder, but that's okay. Yeah, I, I think another set you set, in terms of setting yourself up for success, and a lot of they abandon their cat as aspirations early because they get their pricing so wrong. But what you said, you know, their penny, you know, you know what? For the first month, hell, for the first three months, we're gonna charge by the hour because we don't know we, what we don't know. But after, after 30 days, after 90 days, we will then move to a fixed fee once we've got everything cleaned up and we, we know exactly what we're doing and, and we've got all of the technology working correctly. So there's, yes, it's, it's a bit of a marketing ploy in terms of the gold, silver, and bronze, and everyone goes for the middle. Um, it was just a way for them to sell cloud. But I have a question now for Jen based on what you just said, Dana. Yeah. How many times have you seen this one, Jen? The previous bookkeeper didn't know what they were doing. So I've got to redo everything. And it wasn't that the previous bookkeeper didn't know what they were doing. They just weren't doing it in a way that you were you would. And you not you didn't get any documentation on how they did it. Uh -huh. And it's always that. And every time we get a file that's been passed through bookkeeper to bookkeeper to bookkeeper, we get, okay, we want you to do it this way and clean it all up. And basically, all we're doing is reprocessing work that somebody else has done, but they use maybe different terminology. They use different naming conventions. They decided to put all restaurants under one vendor or something like that. And this new firm didn't want it that way. Some of it's bad. So sometimes you just get a messed up set of books. But there's always something that has to be changed unless you get a brand new company who comes to you the day they started. Being in business. And how often does that happen? We were just talking about this. 99.9% .9 of the clients come in, have some sort of cleanup work. And so for me, there's a cleanup fee 
and then there's a you know a monthly fee going forward and i'd like you penny i evaluate i don't charge hourly but i set them up based off of a number and then every three months every quarter we evaluate for the first year the entire first year we go through and i guarantee you the price has never gone down because it's always a mess. And if they have some cleanup that needs to be done, you're still working through that for an entire year. So for me, that marketing ploy of, oh, bronze, silver, gold. I started the bronze, right? And then we just go up from there. But it's not because we're trying to charge them. It's because the work needs to be consistent. And I guarantee you, you look at a set of books and you look through a set of books through the years, you can see where they've changed people. Same with the tax return, right? But you can see that inconsistency. So it's about being consistent at that time for what you're doing. I'm not going to criticize anybody else on how they did it at that time. The company could could have been a completely different company the way that they worked. So for me, it's not that somebody did it wrong, that they did it differently, like you said. And, you know, we get that that along where even with the outsourcing team, Mm -hmm. I'll get somebody who will slack me go, we had a change in preparers, didn't we, this week? We can tell. I mean, yeah. good bookkeepers and good accountants know when somebody's different is doing the books. Mm-hmm. And there's always, everybody's an individual. Everybody wants, you know, everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame, I guess. But agree that I think that sometimes you have to, if you're somebody who's selling the idea of selling somebody on doing cast, whether you're an app, or you're a consultant, be honest with them that this is not a plug and play. It can get to plug and play. But if you're starting at the get go, this is a total mindset change. Flip. Boom. It's a whole new full dimension for you. It's, it's, you know, the twilight zone. And I'm kind of and- curious. And we were talking about, you know, the two clients and, you know, someone is upset because their division, their new cast division, isn't making money. I think they there's a myth out there that it's a huge revenue generator and you just make hand over fist. But you don't make that right off the start. There is a, a cost of admin and a cost of maintenance and a cost of tweaking that system. And so that comes back into that billable hour type situation. But I'm kind of curious. When do you think when you start a new CAS division, when when would you expect for someone to see revenue or their hand over fist money coming out? If they lined everything up the way you do, it's, you know, getting their workflow their t- and their team. Six months to a year, depending on the size would, of the, of the yeah. initiative. But, yeah. but I, And I was thinking more on a client basis. So I was thinking it's probably going to take at least three months before or you get profitable on the client. And so then if you sort of put that all together, that's probably a good six months before the business is profitable. Yeah. So I think probably six to 12 months is probably about right in terms of, because then also what's happening, I think as well, within that six to 12 months is probably where you're starting to see the value add opportunities, because you're not going to be able to sit down and talk cash flow planning with them in the first six weeks, are you? Because the book- Everything still needs to be lined up and data flowing correctly and all that type of stuff. Whereas I think it's probably within maybe the nine to 12 months, you've been, you're coming up on the year engagement. Now is where the value add opportunities should be coming in. And, th- and that's where I, that's where I think the exponential growth is doing the bookkeeping and becoming as efficient as possible of that to get a, a really nice margin on that, adding in payroll and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But then when you, I think you've been looking at the numbers for the last six months, they've been coming in cleanly, you've been meeting with the client, you're understanding the business. That's when that value add opportunity is going to come and say, hey, we've got to sit down and do a budget. We've got to sit down and do a cash flow plan. Let's get together and, and talk through how you're going to, how you're going to find out. You're growing really quickly, but how are we going to fund that? I, that, that doesn't happen until sort of, yeah, nine months, 12 months in. Yeah. And I think that sometimes, you know, we're a, we're a TikTok world and people expect it to happen. I was going to say, I don't know a lot of people that hold out for that year because it's really a year two where you start to be like, breathe. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing is you are you add on things that you do for the client. You start with the bookkeeping. Maybe you're going to add on AP. And 
you are still working out on that technology and those processes. So even that first year as a, a client grows and maybe the things you do with that client grow, figuring out how to smoothly add them in to that. And it takes, especially if you're not verticalized, it takes a little bit longer to do this with a law firm as opposed to a engineering firm, as opposed to a construction firm, just because you're dealing with three different animals who think differently and want different things. So, you know, and that's another decision you make. Do I just do this with one type of client? And if you don't, it's going to take longer. It just is. And I think as well, in addition to, in addition to that, you've, you've got to have your first tax season or you've got to have that first debt so, so that you, so that you're aware of and cognizant of the, the importance of load balancing. So you're still getting your monthly work done, your weekly work done, as well as the tax work done. Because again, uh, until you've gone through at least one cycle of that, you, you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. And, and hopefully as a result of you've started early and you can actually say no to a few of the tax returns that come in last minute or a few of those new individual clients or new one-off tax returns. But I think that's another part of it is, and, and to your point, Jan, are practitioners going into it with this mindset that this is a, this is a 18 month, two year sort of process of re-engineering our business. That's a big investment. And, 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 you know, three, four, five partner firm, that's two, three partners that you've got to get on and you've got to get, get that buy-in and, and the, the coming together of minds. I don't think a lot of practitioners, and I don't think, I don't think a lot of practitioners to your point recognize that it is, that it's, that it is quite a, a, a journey. Totally different business. Think about that tax what? season. You're saying you've got to get through a tax season, which is right. But the entire firm, how many bookkeepers, you know, Penny, are gearing up for tax season? Already. December. I know, and, right? And and I've run into so many of them who say, yeah, I do cash, but when bookkeeping season comes, I'm on taxes. And the partners pull me in on taxes. Hell, that's how we make a lot of because <laughs> we're the back end bookkeeping stuff. Oh, you get, are you, they're already, it's already starting. It's already starting. Yeah. And I think the difference that's going to help now is the fact that tax season is no longer just tax season anymore. So a year I'll long event. It's a marathon. What? It's a marathon. It's a year yeah. long event. It's a year long event. And there's, a, there's, there's good and bad in it. There's good in that it's going to force you for time management better and to isolate clients. I mean, you do this with clients with tax returns. If they don't have stuff into you by a certain time, it's already in the workflow to off it onto an extension. You know, you're basically pushing the client off, but you're keeping the client. Like you said, you get rid of the client if it's not, they're not going to give you everything. You can't do that with bookkeeping and turn it into a cast operation. You can't put the client off for another month. You'll never get around to advising. You can't put them on extension, can you, for, no. for monthly no. close? No. <laughs> no. you can't, you can't pay advise. Yeah, you can't, you'll never get to that discovery at the end of nine months, three quarters or four quarters of what it is this client needs on growth because you've never had consistent applications, doing it all the same way. Because here's what happens. Stuff comes in late. So, and you just, it was like, Somebody complained that they didn't reset the date in QuickBooks and the invoice went in at the wrong date, you know? It's like, okay, we did 50 of them and some of them came in late and we missed two. We'll go back and fix it tonight. But I know that that kind of stuff happens all the time. So if you're not having constant control, constant flow of the information that you're going to advise on, you can't extend it. It doesn't, you're extending out your ability to make money on the value add every time you do that. Yeah. I, I think that's a really um, valid point and a, a good point for us to pause. I think we could keep talking for, for hours. And I think Jan, if, if you don't mind, would love to have you come back on maybe after QuickBooks Connect once you've attended what, and, and maybe we can sort of dissect if we, if we divide and conquer a lot of these CAS and AI sessions, sort of come, come back with our best of the best and what the, 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 the key tips there. But I think to, to sort of close things out, what's your one takeaway from this discussion, Jan, just for listeners that are, that are, that are thinking or, or have started down this journey, may not, may not be t kicking goals as they, as they were told it would be. What, what's your one takeaway for listeners? 
Well, I think we've really kind of peeled back a bit of what it looks like for CAS, right? First off, we've kind of said it's everything. You know, it has to be defined by the firm. But I mean, for me, really, I don't think enough people talk about how much time it takes and the components. And for me, that's the biggest takeaway. I don't hear these conversations where people are saying truthfully, look, at, it's going to take you two years. Are you in for this? Yeah. I don't, I don't hear that. I'm like, yeah, we can get CAS up and running in about 30 days. Let me give you my step-by-step plan, but it's $14.95 for the first month. So let me do it. So <laughs> that, that's the biggest takeaway. Yeah, fantastic. Honey, what about you? Well, no, I, I, one of the things Jen and I is we're copacetic on all of stuff. <laughs> the conversations we have, it's like, you've been talking to the same people I've been talking to. <laughs> yeah. So I, I agree with her that the hard part is that sometimes if you're listening to the marketing people and, you know, I love the app developers. I think they do a great job. Their support teams are amazing, but it's not always a flip of a switch. You're dealing, there is, there is a human element involved in all of this. In every single transaction, there's a human element. You'd like to break it down to robots. I know that would be much easier for most of people to think of it that way. But it doesn't happen that way in real life. And it takes time. It takes time. It takes two years for an elephant to be born. And they're born just ready to rock and roll. It took two years for them to cook. Our kids, they're only cooking for nine months. And you got to carry those little suckers around for at least two years before they're off on their own. Right, Damien? Right. Wyatt, Wyatt, Wyatt is not pulling his weight yet. Like, come on, buddy. <laughs> You've got to get it together. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but now, I, I will say, to close out my final thing, I think the benefits and the opportunity of CAS, I think that is real. Yes, But I, I think the journey to it, it's not as, ro- it's not as ro- rosy a journey as some people do make out. So... The, I disagree. The, I think it can be rosy as long as you take the glasses off and paint the vision of rosy. <laughs> well, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 no. I, 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 it, it can be, but, but, but I think again, it, it's all about in, intentionality and and approaching it um, appropriately. And and so I think again, I think the benefits are there, but I think having that plan, maybe Jan, that was sort of one of your first comments out of the gate, was having that plan is really important and recognizing. Right as we've just closed out, that this is an 18 month plan, two year plan. It's not a 30 day, 14.95 a month type plan. But on that note, I think that's been a, a tremendous episode. Jan, where can people find you and more information about you? Yeah, absolutely. Best way is Twitter and LinkedIn. My handle is jazzfun, J-A-Z-F-U-N. So that's the best way that they can find me and reach out to me. Yeah, okay, we'll uh, put that in the notes. In the show notes? Yep, for sure. Penny, where can people find you? Oh, they can find me at QuickBooks Connect Black next week, but I'm on the LLC. <laughs> and Damien <laughs> and Jan, we're yeah. all going to be there. We're all, yeah. all going to be there. So fingers crossed we'll get this episode live before QuickBooks Connect. But Jan, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, Penny, yeah. pleasure as always. Jan, Thanks. look forward to seeing uh, you uh, next week. And Penny, Nabila and Shamila as well. Uh, very excited to see the, the team. But ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed the episode, write a review, share a like, share it on your LinkedIn profiles, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll get the good word of strategy and the virtual controller out. But until next time, have a wonderful afternoon.